The kinetics of nuclear decay are going to be the topic of this lesson. My name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, in addition to high school and college science prep, we also do MCAT, DAT, and OAT prep as well. I'll be sure to leave a link in the description below for where you can find those courses. Now, this lesson is part of my new general chemistry playlist, and for a couple more chapters, I'll be releasing several lessons a week throughout the remainder of the school year. Uh, so if you want to be notified every time I post a new lesson or my next playlist, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification. So the kinetics of nuclear decay, this is largely going to be review for the, the majority of this lesson, and then we'll kind of apply it to like uh, radioactive dating uh, towards the end of this lesson. So, but it turns out that all of nuclear decay is first order for the, the relevant parts we'll look at, all the spontaneous routes of decay anyways. So in being first order, we don't have to worry about zero order or second order like we did back in the chemical kinetics chapter. We'll be dealing exclusively with just this first order process. And so it's going to follow the first order integrated rate law, which is a couple different forms in which it's written. So, and we'll be dealing pretty heavily with half-lives. It's often pretty characteristic uh, to give you the half-life of a radioactive nuclide. So notice this equation shows us that we can get the, radi the, or the half-life from the, uh, the rate constant or, you know, the rate constant from the half-life. But most of the time, you're probably more likely to be given half-lives in this particular context than the rate constant. But you should know there's a lovely, easy relationship between the two. So, and in fact, that's actually where we're going to start. We're going to derive this lovely half-life expression because it's kind of important. So, if we take a look at the original uh, first order integrated rate law, if you subtract off ln of n naught to the other side of the equation, and then realize that you know subtracting logs is the same thing as dividing them under a single log, we get this lovely equation. And so if we take a look at that lovely equation, we'll take the natural log and then n over n naught, n is how much of that radioactive nuclide you have now, and not is how much you started with. Well, the half-life is defined as the time it takes for half your sample to be consumed, or in this case, in a nuclear context, we say half of your radioactive nuclide to decay away. So how much do you have left? Well, if you started with n naught, you'd have half of n naught left. Well, half of n naught divided by n naught is just simply a half. And so at the half-life time, this becomes natural log of a half equaling negative k, and the time it took to get there is what's defined as the half-life time. And if we rearrange and solve for this here, we can say that your half-life is going to equal the natural log of one-half over k. Well, go figure, guess what, uh, and I lost a negative sign there, my bad, negative one, uh, ln of one-half over k. And the natural log of one-half, go figure, is equal to negative 0.693. And that way, a negative times a negative 0.693 gives you a positive, and that's where this relationship comes from. So now we talk about half-lives a lot. What we don't talk about are, well, what about a third life? What about a fifth life? But you could, and I've seen professors ask it on a test, and essentially, instead of putting in natural log of one-half here, they're expecting you to put in natural log of one-third or natural log of one-fifth, and you can figure out the time it took for a third of your sample to decay. So, or, or I guess a third of your sample to be left, I guess is what it really amounts to. So, or a fifth of your sample to be left, or something along these lines. So just kind of keep that in mind. All right, so now that we've kind of reviewed what that half-life looks like, uh, you got to realize that it's, again, real common to kind of structure this around half-lives in this chapter. And some of the math, you might get away with even having to use these integrated rate laws, and you might be able to either exactly calculate it or at least approximate it well enough to, to pick out the right answer in multiple choice without ever having to pull out your calculator. So let's take a look and see how this looks. Let's say we started off with a particular mass. Well, let's just say we started off with 64 grams of a radioactive nuclide. So, well, after it decayed for a half-life, what mass of that nuclide would remain? Well, in this case, you'd have 32 grams left. And if it experienced another half-life, how much would be left after that point? You just keep cutting it a half, so then you'd be down to 16 grams. And another half-life, you'd be down to 8 grams. And another half-life, you'd be down to 4 grams, and so on and so forth. You just keep dividing by 2 or multiplying by a half every half-life. And so if we look at this, one thing to note, a lot of students look at this and be like, oh, you've gone through half, you know, five half-lives. One, two, three, four, five. Bad counting. But count the arrows. It's the process that is the half-life. So count the arrows. One, two, three, four half-lives. And so this would be the first half-life, the second half-life, the third half-life, the fourth half-life. And so a couple different ways you could look at this or be presented with this. You might be asked, you know, if you start with a 64 gram sample, and let's say the half-life equals five hours. Well, then how long would it take to where you've only got four grams left? Well, you'd have to look at this and be like, oh, well, that's an exact number of half-lives because all I do got to do to 64 to get to four is divide by two four times. Well, and if 
each of those half-lives is five hours, well then four of them would be a total of 20 hours. And you could do that in your head. Because it was a perfect number of half-lives, the math comes out easy. Now it could be asked exactly the other way. It could be like a researcher was doing a, a kinetics experiment and they started with 64 grams of a, a radioactive nuclide and after 20 hours they had four grams left. What's the half-life? And you have to realize that again, to go from 64 grams to four grams, that's exactly four half-lives. And if that took a total of 20 hours, well then what's one half-life? If four half-lives would be 20 hours, then just one of them divided by four would get you five hours for that half-life. So it could be asked either way, either giving you the half-life and then figure out the total time to get to four grams or give the total time to four grams and go backtrack to figure out that half-life. So it could go either way. Now, what if instead of going all the way to four grams, so let's say again, we're dealing with half-life of five hours. What if I said, hey, get me to where we only have five grams left? And that's where life kind of sucks. So maybe, depends on if it's multiple choice, it might suck, it might not. So what you'd have to say is, well, okay, five grams is not a perfect number of half-lives. However, three half-lives would get me to having eight grams left. Four halves would get me to having four grams left. Well, three half-lives would be 15 hours if the, again, the half-life is five hours. So, so three half-lives would be 15 hours. Four half-lives would be 20 hours. So to get to five grams, which is somewhere in between, would be somewhere between 15 and 20 hours. And because five grams is quite a bit closer to four grams, it's probably closer to 20 hours than it is to 15. And if there's only one answer choice in that range, well, great. You just pick it and you move on. You don't do any of the math. However, if that's not the case, if you got, well, let's say all the answer choices are between four and eight grams, well, then what do you do to find out how long it takes to get to where you only have five grams left? So, well, then that's when you got to bust out these first order integrated rate laws. So the first order integrated rate law is what you use to solve for anything that you can't do in your head because it's not a perfect number of half-lives. All right, so if we want to solve for this time here, so we'd take and we'd say, okay, ln of n, well, I want to get to the point where I've got five grams left equals the ln of n naught, I started with 64 grams, minus k times t, and I wanna solve for t, and the problem is I can't solve for t unless I also know k. Okay, well where do I get k from? Well, I get it from the half-life expression right here. If we rearrange this a little bit, we can see that k is equal to 0 0.693 over the half-life. That's k. And so what I'm gonna do, I'm not actually gonna even solve for it separately, I'm just gonna substitute right in here for k, and I'm gonna substitute in 0 0.693 over the half-life, which we said was five hours. And just substitute it right in, and now I can solve for t. And you're definitely gonna want a calculator here, and again, we said it should be somewhere between 15 and 20 hours, should be closer to 20, so let's see what we get. All right, so we're gonna take the natural log of five, minus, we'll subtract this over to the other side, the natural log of 64, natural log of 64, and I'll hit enter. It's like negative 2.55. So, and then I'm gonna divide by negative 0.693 over five. So divided by, and I'll put this all in parentheses, divided by negative 0.693, divided by five, and close my parentheses, and we're gonna get 18.4 hours. Cool, and life is good. And like I said, had there only been one answer choice in between 15 and 20, uh, or at least closer to 20 in that ballpark, well then I would have just picked it and I never would have done all this math. But I wanted to make sure you'd seen all this math worked out as well, just in case uh, the answer choices weren't so nice. So, but oftentimes you'll be able to at least ballpark it in your head without ever having to do the plug and chug in this particular chapter. All right, so let's see, how else could this be presented? So. Well, this could also be presented, instead of dealing with the mass of a radioactive nuclide, it could be presented in percentages and fractions. So, well, initially you'd start off with all of it, and in percentages, that's 100%, and in fractions, that just means one. And so what percent would you have after the first half-life? Well, you'd have 50%, or what fraction? Well, a half. And after a second half-life, you'd be down to 25%, or half of a half is a fourth. And after a third half-life, you'd be down to 12.5%, which is half of a fourth, and one half times one fourth is one eighth. And then finally, after a fourth half-life, that'd be 6.25%, or half of an eighth. One half times one eighth is one sixteenth, and so on and so forth. And so 
you could have this, you know, instead of being told that, you know, you started with 64 grams and, you know, how long does it take to get down to four grams if the half-life is five hours and figuring out that it's 20 hours, you might be told, well, if you start off, you know, with a radioactive nuclide, how long does it take to get all the way down to where only 6.25% remains or only one sixteenth of the sample remains? Same question. You'd have to be like, oh, to get down to 6.25%, that's just taking 100 and dividing by two four times. It's four half-lives and four times five hours would be 20 hours. Okay. So same thing to get down to 1 16th. You'd have to realize that if you start off with all of it, you got to divide by two or multiply by half four times to get to 1 16th. Four half-lives would be, once again, 20 hours, assuming, again, you're given a half-life of five hours. Now, be careful, because sometimes until, instead of telling you what you have left, and this always gives you what you have left, you have 25% left, you have 12.5% left, you have 6.25% left, you could be given how much has decayed instead. So notice if you only got 25% of your sample left, well, that's because 75% has decayed already. If you only got 12.5% of your radioactive nuclide remaining, it's because the other 87.5% has decayed. Same thing with fractions. You know, if you've only got a fourth of your sample left, it's because three-fourths has already decayed. If you've only got an eighth of your sample left, it's because the other seven-eighths has already decayed away. If you only got a sixteenth of your sample remaining, it's because the other fifteen-sixteenths has decayed away. And so it might be phrased in that terminology, and you got to be careful because a lot of students don't see the difference between what fraction or what percentage remains versus how much has decayed. Now there's one last way this might be presented. So it turns out it's pretty customary for us to measure radioactivity in a variety of different ways, but they're all going to kind of deal with some sort of like disintegrations per second or disintegrations per minute. And we call that the activity or radioactivity. So and I'm going to look at this as disintegrations per minute. There's a few different units you might use and stuff like this, but I'm just going to use disintegrations per minute. So and it turns out the activity of a radioactive sample is directly proportional to how much of that radioactive sample you have. And so as you go through a half-life and the amount of the radioactive sample is cut in half, well, because the activity is directly proportional to how much you have, so is the activity then going to be cut in half. And so you might be told the number of disintegrations per minute. And I'm just going to write this disintegrations per minute. It's not really written that way, but I'm going to write it that way. And let's just say it started off with 20 disintegrations per minute. Well, then after a half-life, you'd be down to 10 disintegrations per minute. And after another half-life, you'd be down to five disintegrations per minute. And after another half-life, you'd be down to 2.5. And then finally, 1.25 disintegrations per minute. And so this could all be given in terms of activity as well. So again, whether it's the exact mass of the nuclide, the percentage, the fraction, or in terms of activity, it all is going to lead to the same kind of calculations. And again, if you're given you know, a situation dealing with a perfect number of half-lives, life is good. You can do that in your head. You can just keep dividing by two or multiplying by half. And again, you can use your calculator. Don't get me wrong. If the numbers aren't nice. So however, the big key is that if, you're, if it's not a perfect number of half-lives, perfect number of times of cutting something in half, then you got to resort back to this first order integrated rate law. And usually the way it's going to work is that you're going to use this lovely expression to get the rate constant from the half-life, and then you'll substitute it back into the first order integrated rate law to solve for time or to solve for one of the variables that you don't know. All right, so we can take now what we've learned about the kinetics of nuclear decay and apply it to radioactive dating. And specifically, we're going to take a look at radio carbon dating. Now, there are other forms of dating like uranium and potassium argon and things of this sort. We're only going to look at radiocarbon dating here in this lesson. And radiocarbon dating is useful for dating something that was once alive. It had to be once alive, whether plant or animal or bacteria or something like that. It had to be once living. We'll see why in a second. Uh, but also it only is going to really, really work like 50 to 70,000 years maximum. So in the longer it goes, the kind of the more approximate that, uh, uh, that age range is going to become when you calculate it. So, but the idea here is that there is radioactive carbon-14 in the Earth's atmosphere, and that comes from cosmic radiation converting nitrogen-14 into carbon-14. And that carbon-14 is going to undergo a constant rate of beta decay. And when it undergoes beta decay, it's no longer carbon-14. So the amount of carbon-14 in the Earth's atmosphere has reached some sort of equilibrium between the amount that's being formed from the cosmic radiation interacting with nitrogen and then the amount that's decaying. And so... How does it get into a living creature? Well, this is probably going to be in the form of carbon dioxide, and plants and other photosynthetic organisms are going to take in this radioactive carbon dioxide with all the rest of the carbon dioxide, and they're going to incorporate it into their 
bodies. We'll call them bodies. And then animals are going to come along and eat those plants or photosynthetic organisms, and then animals will eat those animals. And eventually, we're all going to incorporate a steady amount of this radioactive carbon-14 into us, everything that was once alive, in one way, shape, or form, whether plant, animal, or other. As long as it was living, it'll have this steady amount. So, and the steady amount comes from that you're going to keep ingesting, in one way, shape, or form, a little tiny amount of this radioactive carbon-14, but it's also going to be decaying. And every living creature is going to reach this steady state equilibrium where the amount coming in is going to equal the amount going out until no more is coming in, i.e. the organism has died. Once it's died, it's no longer eating anything uh, or no longer doing photosynthesis, and so no longer will it have any input of this radioactive carbon-14. And that's going to serve as a timestamp, because from that moment on, the amount of radioactive carbon-14 it has in it, in its dead carcass, is going to be slowly decreasing as our radioactive carbon-14 undergoes beta decay. And so it gives us a lovely timestamp based on how much, like, let's say I find a piece of, you know, ancient wood from a fireplace in, in some whatever, you know, uh, I can test that wood to see how much radioactive carbon-14 it still has, compare that to the amount of radioactive carbon-14 in any living thing today, and kind of get in a, a ballpark. And it turns out that we know the half-life for this radioactive carbon-14 so might be 5715 or 5730, depending on who you talk to. I'm going to use 5730 years. And so we got a couple problems here. So first off, the amount of radioactive carbon-14 is tiny to begin with. Again, uh, for the naturally occurring isotopes, 98.9% .9 of carbon weighs 12, 1.1% weighs 13. And if you notice, 98.9 .9 plus 1.1 .1 adds up to 100%. And it turns out the amount of radioactive carbon-14 is like 0. 0.000 something. It's a really tiny percentage. And so measuring such a tiny amount is something we can do up to a point. And so it turns out once you cut the amount of radioactive carbon-14 in half so many times, there's just so little left that we can't accurately measure it. And so that's why this is going to be limited to 50 to 70,000 years. Because once you've gone through, you know, 10 or 12 half-lives, you just don't have enough radioactive carbon-14 left for us to really accurately measure. And so uh, it's just not going to happen. So that's why this is going to kind of get capped. So, but now that we know this half-life, all we have to do is measure the amount of radioactive carbon-14 in a sample of something that was once alive and then compare it to the amount that's in anything that's still living and has still reached that steady state equilibrium. So question we're going to look at here is the carbon-14 activity of a piece of cloth at an archaeological site is 4.1 disintegrations per minute. If the carbon-14 activity of living organisms is 16.4 disintegrations per minute, what is the approximate age of the piece of cloth? Now, I chose this problem, and so I chose the numbers, and I chose them to be nice here. So we got 16.4 disintegrations per minute. And we're going to go all the way down to 4.1, and, and I, I chose these numbers because it's an exact number of half-lives here, so that's nice. So we're going to go down after one half-life to 8.2 disintegrations per minute, and after another half-life to 4.1 disintegrations per minute. And so this is going to be an exact number of half-lives. And I could plug this into my first order integrated rate law. I'd use the half-life to get the rate constant, substitute it in right there. I'd say that I've got 16.4 disintegrations per minute was the initial amount before something died, and that now it's got 4.1, and then I'd solve for time. Except because this is a perfect number of half-lives, this is relatively simplistic to do. So this first half-life took 5,730 years, and the second half-life also took 5,730 years. And so all I got to do is add that up and just take 5,730 times 2, and we're going to get 11,000. Well, that's, it helps if you plug this in correctly into your calculator. Let's try that one more time. 11,460 years. because it was a perfect number of half-lives. And again, had this been some number that wasn't uh, easily obtained by dividing that first number by two a certain uh, successive number of times, well, then I would have been doing exactly what we did earlier, involving, again, getting the rate constant from the half-life, substituting into that first-order integrated rate law, and solving from there. But this is essentially what they're doing with radiocarbon dating. And the key is, again, it had to at one time be alive. So, and then we're just gonna compare the amount of, you know, it's, it's carbon-14 activity, to the carbon-14 activity in something that is still alive today. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, a like and a comment let me know are pretty much the best things you can do to support the channel. And if you are looking for nuclear chemistry practice or 
preparation for your final exams, like final exam rapid reviews and practice finals, then take a look at my general chemistry master course. I'll leave a link in the description. Free trial is available. Happy studying.